Welcome back to Three Lines TCG everyone, my name is Jimbo and today we're going to be doing a deep dive into the first ever printed Pokemon TCG set, the notorious and iconic base set. Now I've talked about wanting to make a video like this for quite some time now, basically a comprehensive guide going over a specific card or set that regardless of the information you know going into the video, you can still hopefully learn something new. Now I want to stress that I'm doing this from a collector's perspective and not a player's perspective. So we're not going to talk about the competitive scene, you know, what the cards do, the card game itself. We're more so going to go into the history of base set, why it's still iconic and relevant today, 28 years later. The different printings, the error cards, the sealed products, pretty much everything you need to know if you yourself want to start collecting the base set. Now, I will say there is quite a lot of information in today's video. I did quite a lot of research into figuring out everything about the base set. So I apologize in advance if things start to get confusing. I'm going to do my best to edit this and add visuals to make it as palpable as possible, basically. Um, but if you enjoyed this video, please let me know down below in the comments. I will gladly make more content like this. We could do different Pokemon sets, Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever you really want. I really enjoy, like I say, doing the research and trying to make a video out of it. So I also do pack openings in this channel. On this channel, I do... I recently went over my personal collection. So if you enjoy TCG related content, do us a favor and subscribe to the channel. It would mean the world to me. And before we get into the video, I do want to shout somebody out. It's a person who goes by the name of Colors. That's usually his username, C-U-L-L-E-R-S. Now, pretty much without his information and his extensive knowledge of the Pokemon industry and Pokemon base set in particular, this video really wouldn't be possible. It seems every article, every Every blog post, every forum post somehow originates to his information. So I really do want to shout him out. I don't think he has a YouTube channel, but I do know he has a blog called pokeyprofessional.com. He must know something if that's the name of his website. And of course, he has a eBay page called Pokemon Place. So go check those out, support where you can. I don't know him personally, but from one collector to another, all I've really got to say is you've got to calm it down, bud. I mean, you're good, but you're too good. You're making the rest of us all look bad, okay? But the fact is, you've been making us all look bad. I'm sorry, sir? No, I'm just kidding. Of course, it's brilliant, it's incredible stuff. I can only hope that today I barely, you know, explain this in the best way possible in a video format as well as you do in a written format. Anyway, without any further ado, we've got quite a lot to talk about today, so let's get into the video. Let's start by going over some of the basics. Now, the base set is obviously the first expansion in the Pokemon trading card game, releasing on the 20th of October 1996 in Japan and the 9th of January 1999 for the rest of the world. The company known as Media Factory was the first distributor of the Pokemon trading card game in Japan from 1996 up until 2006 when the Pokemon company took over. Now, Wizards of the Coast, who is owned by Hasbro and famous for Magic of the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons, were responsible for the translation and distribution of the English printings of Pokemon cards from 1998 till 2003, when the Pokemon Company International by Nintendo took over the license. This is often why the base set and other sets prior to 2003 are referred to as the WotC era of Pokemon cards, WotC of course standing for Wizards of the Coast. Now, it's important to note that although the Pokemon TCG for the English print was released in January of 99, because it was so brand new at a time, well, let's just be honest, in the 90s, TCGs were nowhere near as popular as they are today. Card stores actually didn't receive the cards until around April, May, you know, even Mar March, April, May time around that time frame. So as a kid in America, especially, you probably weren't getting your cards until the summer of 99. Uh, you know, stores were having to take a pretty big risk on a TCG they wouldn't know would do well. I mean, at the time, probably the only one that was just as successful would be Magic the Gathering, right? That was probably the only thing they could compare to. Of course, Wizards of the Coast made Magic the Gathering, so they had a pretty decent formula I guess when it came to doing that um, I would say the only thing that would separate Pokemon apart from Magic and sort of all the other ones at the time would be the rising popularity at the time the Game Boy games Pokemon Red, Blue and Yellow 
These games were first released in Japan in 1996, titled Pocket Monsters Red and Pocket Monsters Green, with Pocket Monsters Blue releasing later that year. Now, Pokemon Red and Blue wasn't released in America until September 1998, and not until October of 1999 in Europe. Pokemon Yellow version Special Pikachu Edition, also known as Pokemon Yellow, officially released in Japan in 1998 and in America in October 99. Europe actually didn't get Pokemon Yellow until June of 2000. So these dates are important because Pokemon Red and Blue basically released four months before the official release of the Pokemon TCG. As you remember though, these cards probably weren't available until around April, March time. So there was probably about six to seven months of you waiting, you know, playing the games on your Game Boy before you got your hands on the cards. And there's no question at the time about the popularity of Pokemon, um, even in Japan and of course America. I remember South Park making an episode called Chin Pokemon back in the early days of South Park. I believe it aired in late 1999. And it basically showed how obsessed kids were about the Pokemon, about Pokemon in general in the state at the time. You also had the Pokemon anime, of course, airing in the US on September 8th, 1998. So by the summer of 99, there were plenty of kids ready to play and start collecting the Pokemon cards themselves. Uh, but even so, something this new will always add a bit of risk to companies and small stores that don't quite know if it's going to do as well as the hype sort of suggests it will. Let's move on now to the set itself and explain the different types of printing varieties that existed within the base set. This expansion has 102 cards in total for both English and Japanese. Of that 102, 69 are Pokemon, 26 are trainer cards, and 7 are energy cards. In total, there are 16 holographics, 16 non-holo rares, 32 uncommons, 32 commons, and 6 no rarity energy cards. In terms of how the set was sorted, the English print numbering is sorted alphabetically with descending rarity. This sorting would stay the same until the release of the 2011 black and white Pokemon set expansion. The Japanese print numbering is sorted based on type and ascending rarity. This would stay the same up until the release of the E-Card Era series of cards. Base set was also printed in many different languages. Those include Chinese, Dutch, English, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish, and Korean. Typically, Korean cards are the hardest cards to find. That language in particular had a very short-lived print run, whereas the English and the Japanese languages, those are the most commonly collected languages in the hobby to date. Interestingly enough, Base Set actually has the most variants in the history of the Pokemon TCG franchise. Those printing variants are as follows. First edition cards, shadowless English cards, unlimited cards, fourth print English cards, no rarity symbol Japanese cards, trainer deck cards, and lastly, error cards. Now, before I begin explaining shadowless cards and what that means, there are two theories behind the first print runs of the first edition and the shadowless cards. A print run means the number of copies of a book, magazine, or in this case, Pokemon set that is printed at one given time. The base set had a total of eight print runs. For now, ignore the eighth print run. I will talk about that in detail later on. So the first theory suggests that when Wizards of the Coast distributed the first print run of base set cards, they used a unique template that was only applied to the very first print run. These of course being shadowless cards. The second to seventh print run used a completely different template referred to now as the unlimited print run and showed that there was a distinguishable difference between the two templates. Basically, Wizards of the Coast applied some of the cards with a first edition stamp and any extras with no stamp. This meant that first edition shadowless cards and regular shadowless cards all came from the same print run. The second theory suggests the first print run only had the first edition shadowless cards, which are divided into thick and thin first edition stamps on the hollows, which I'll explain what that means later on, and that the second print run was the non-first edition shadowless, or what many people like to refer to as just shadowless, meaning that in this theory, the third to seventh print run used the unlimited template. 
This theory seems to lean towards making first edition Shadowless cards much rarer, given they only ran during the very first print run, but either way, honestly, any Shadowless card, whether it has a first edition stamp or not, is going to be rarer than the unlimited version. We're comparing 1-2 to two print runs versus 5-6 to six print runs. I personally like the explanation given by Colors, posted on the E4 forum, which states the following, quote, Wizards of the Coast started production on base set Pokemon cards. They used the Shadowless template and created a bunch of cards. Some of these cards are given a thick first edition stamp. Some time goes by and they realize they've miscalculated the amount of hollow cards they needed stamped. So some Shadowless hollow sheets go back and get thin first edition stamps applied. The first edition cards are sold and sent out. Wizards still have a bunch of shadowless sheets which they cut up and sell as the intended unlimited version. After this, Wizards make aesthetic and text corrections to the templates and start producing more cards. These new cards have shadows applied to them and are sold off as unlimited cards. People notice the difference and start calling the old unlimited cards shadowless. There's six more print runs done with these changes. So basically, Colors here is leaning more towards agreeing with the first theory, suggesting that regardless of whether the Shadowless card had his first edition stamp or not, it was all printed in the very first print run. The remaining print runs were all the unlimited print, and then the eighth print was right at the end. Speaking of unlimited prints, let's go ahead and talk about that next. So, like I just said, depending on which theory you believe, either through the 2nd to 7th print run or the 3rd to 7th print run, Wizards of the Coast use a brand new printing template, now known as the Unlimited Print. Given this printing span for over 5 to 6 print runs, these are more likely the cards you're going to find in your childhood collection. There are many differences between the Unlimited Print and the Shadowless Print. The difference I use the most that helps me tell the difference immediately now, even from a distance, is the copyright. The copyright date on the unlimited print reads 1995, 96, 98, Nintendo Creatures Game Freak, copyright 1999. And it's the same thing on the shadowless print, except there is a 99 after the 98 in the copyright. The eighth print run of the base set goes by many names in the hobby. Some like to call it the fourth print, some others like to call it the UK release, but whatever you call it, there's only four distinct differences between this print run and the former print runs. The two most distinguishable difference out of the four is the copyright date showing 1999 to 2000 on the bottom of the card, and a very slight colour difference. Although it's a small change, it's definitely a big enough of a change for it to be different. If you're a collection completionist like myself, these are pretty significant differences, right? Briefly, let me explain the different names that come about with this print run. It's, it can get really confusing with how many different names this set has or this specific print run has. So if you're trying to look these up online on eBay or if you're talking to a vendor in person, you may want to figure out why they're called what they're called. The main reason why this print is known as the fourth print is due to the four unique differences I just listed. One being the first edition Shadowless, two being the non-first edition Shadowless, or just Shadowless, three being the 1999 Unlimited, Unlimited print, and four being this print, the 1999 to 2000 Unlimited print. So although it's technically the eighth printing in the set, it's the fourth and final variant change within the rest of the printings, right? This print is also known as the UK print or the UK release, mainly because it was 100% confirmed at the time that there was a UK factory creating this print run. I know this myself because I grew up in England and a lot of my cards actually came from this 1999 to 2000 set. Now, that being said, we now know that these cards were also produced in some parts of the US and in Australia, so it's technically not correct calling it the UK release. I have heard, however, that the only hollow foils that have the 1999 to 2000 copyright date come from the UK packs. Do note, though, that this isn't guaranteed, so you can still open a UK pack and get the, you know, the... the copyright date that just has the 1999, just like the unlimited print. Overall, because this is still not very well known by casual collectors like this eighth print run, not a lot of people still know about it. It gets called so many different names, you know, fourth print, UK release, it gets called so many different things, mainly just out of ignorance of people not knowing that it even exists. I will also mention that it's speculated that this is actually the shortest print run out of the eight. Okay, are you still with me?
Now, I know I just threw a lot of information at you and it can get quite confusing, but this part is pretty important to know before we move on. In terms of like collecting these different distinct differences between all the different prints and everything like that, it's very important because you can have a binder that's worth, you know, a hundred grand if you've got all the first edition cards, or if you've got all the unlimited, it could be worth a couple hundred bucks, you know? So it really does depend in terms of the different variants and all the little differences. It does matter. Um, and I know it's confusing because there's a lot going on and it has the most variants out of any other set in the actual history of Pokemon. So it makes sense why this is going to be quite a lot, but... Like I say, I just want to do maybe a quick recap, just going over everything I've said in the best, break it down as best as I can. So let's start from the top, right? Wizards of the Coast, they would, they did magic, they did Dungeons and Dragons, they did all that stuff. They were the ones that were in charge of the English base set, and they basically printed it eight different times, right? So those were known as print runs. Basically, they printed cards off during a certain period of time. So that could be days, it could be weeks. Let's just use months as a easy example. And let's picture sort of a timeline here. So let's go, let's just say it was a year. Let's say they printed this set for a year. It was probably more than that. Not, I don't think any less, but probably more. But just for the sake of simplicity, they printed this set for a year. And let's say they did the print runs within a month, right? So they printed this eight different times and then people started to notice you know later on probably not at the time but later on they started to notice hey look we've got four i see four differences with the printings that you've given me there was obviously first edition cards there were these shadowless cards there were unlimited cards and then there was that eighth print run so you know usually these differences are interpreted as printing template changes and sort of what i mean by a printing template change this will date me a lot here, but just imagine like you're back in school. Let's go all the let's go way back to the dinosaur eras of 2013. You're in English class and you've got to print off your five paragraph essay that you've written. So you you know you print off the paper, you look at it, and you realize that you've accidentally centered all the text. So you go, I can't do that. I can, that's not MLA format. I've got to I've got to fix that. So. You don't want to get an F, so you go back onto your computer and you maybe change some texting, some words here or there, maybe change a couple couple little grammatical errors, but then you ultimately left a line, everything back to where it is, you print it back off, boom, you, you're happy with what you got, you turn it in, you know. Obviously that dates me because I'm sure nowadays you, uh, you upload it to a Dropbox, you probably email it. Uh, let alone, you probably do an AI checker nowadays, right? Make sure that AI didn't write, you know, write the paper for you. Um, but anyway, so just imagine that. That's exactly the same thing that they did with these print runs. So for whatever reason, they felt that there was an error, whether they printed, they didn't have enough cards. Maybe they, they allocated a certain amount of cards and then they didn't really account for the demand of Pokemon at the time. Whatever the case might be, they changed the printing variant, the template to fix that or to, to meet that demand or fix the error or whatever the case might be, right? Whatever they were satisfied with. And I think where this gets quite confusing is determining, okay, what was an actual printing template change and what was just what Wizards of the Coast did? So if you look at it sort of objectively, you're like, okay, there's four different changes, right? There's a first edition, there's the shadowless, there's the unlimited, the eighth print. So they must have had four different printing templates, right? And that would make sense. But I think where, you know, and this is just my opinion, so I could be wrong, but my, you know, how I've interpreted this is Wizards of the Coast, realistically, probably only had three different print runs, right? They, they had, or three different templates, right? So they had the shadowless, so they had the shadowless, and then some of those shadowless cards in that first print run were given a first edition stamp. And then whatever they had left over, yeah, th those just became what they wanted to be the unlimited print, right? So you've got to remember at the time, I mean, Wizards of the Coast did magic, right? And magic had the alpha cards. They're kind of well known for saying, let's just print off a certain amount. So let's just say they printed off a thousand first edition cards. It was obviously more than that, but just for simplicity's sake. So they printed off a thousand first edition cards and everything else was just unlimited, right? They want to make those first a thousand people feel special. Um, it's the very first printing of this brand new thing they're doing so wizards have kind of been known to do that right so they do that they print off the first edition and then the shadowless and then you know after that let's just say that was a, about the span of a month right and then after that for whatever reason whether like i say it was due to allocations they didn't have enough cards for the demand that was crazy at the time right or whether or not they just thought um, you know, there was too many errors or there was too many mistakes. Let's go ahead and change it. So they then the next month said, okay, when we reprint these, let's do a template change. Let's add 
some shadows, let's change the copyright date, let's fix a couple errors, let's make some of the text a bit bolder, things like that. And then they came out with the unlimited print, that's what it's known as now, right? And they obviously liked that because that ran for five to six print runs, which if we want to go back to our timeline, if we think they took a month for that first print run, that means that they the next 10 months were printing this unlimited print run. So they obviously liked it. And then right at the end, like the very last year, we're now going into, you know, t the year 2000, a, a year in, you know, we're, what, we're at the 11th, 12th month now, they do the eighth print run. And so that makes sense to me from a timeline perspective. You've got to also think from a business perspective, they were entering into a brand new market with the eighth print run, right? So if you remember when I talked about the games at the very beginning, a lot of those games didn't make it to Europe till like June of 2000. So the hype and the craze outside of the US, well, and obviously some smaller parts of the US, but like Australia, England, you know, other parts of Europe, there was no hype. There was no craze until 2000. And then when that year came around, they were like, okay, where's our Pokemon cards? Come on, you guys got some, you need to get some for us. So think of it from a business perspective that this eighth print run, they kind of want to make sure it's perfect. I mean, they've had trial errors, they've, they've, you know, they've done the different print runs now for 10, 11 months, and they're like, this last run, you know, this last run we need to make sure it does well. We're entering, in, entering into a brand new market and we want to make sure that we're just as successful in this new market as we were in the bigger parts of America and Japan. So we know that this is true just based on the fact that if you make a new product in the year 2000, you know, legal reasons, you've got to put on the copyright that you made it in 2000, right? That you were established and that was created in the year 2000. So there obviously wasn't too many changes. There was four changes in total from the eighth print to the unlimited print. So there wasn't anything too crazy, but there was enough things to make a significant change in the eighth print run. And then obviously start distributing that to smaller, smaller nations, smaller markets, places in Europe, places in, in Australia, and of course, other places in the US that probably didn't get the actual first print run or the unlimited print runs, right? The US is a big place, so I'm sure there was smaller shops and smaller places that didn't get those runs. So that's kind of a bit of a breakdown. I know that was a lot that I just threw at you again, but that's the best way I can sort of explain it in terms of how this all, how the story actually worked with base set and its printings. The one thing I'll throw out there, and this is my opinion, so a lot of people, and I think you can go back and forth, this is pretty highly debated, but it is kind of been proven now that the eighth print run was the shortest print run. So in my opinion, in terms of rarity, and like I say, I will be a bit biased because I'm from England, but the rarity of the print runs, most of the time it's perceived that the first edition cards are the rarest, right? You know, the first edition Shadowless Charizard is the most expensive card in the Pokemon game, right? Well, not, it's, it's one of the most expensive cards, let's just say that, right? So most people consider the first edition cards to be the rarest, and in general, this is, you know, I kind of agree just because usually the first print run of anything, no matter what it is, it's the rarest because it was the first that ever came out. You know, there's, there's some sort of uh, stigma of it being, hey, this was the very first time this was printed. That makes it pretty rare, even if it was printed thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, because it was the very first one, most people consider that to be the rarest in general. But from a nostalgia perspective, I was growing up in England, I could never get the first edition Shadowless. That never made it to England. So the only cards that were available to me would have been the unlimited print and then this eighth print. So a lot of, like I say, when I was growing up, a lot of my cards actually had those different copyright dates. They were that eighth print variant. Obviously I lived in maybe a market that was much smaller than, because I wasn't from London or any of the big cities, right? So, you know, that to me has a bit more nostalgic ties to it. And that usually is a pretty big factor that determines pricing with a lot of these collection-based cards. Um, but, you know, like I say, if I was going to rank the rarity of all four of the, you know, four of the variants, for me, it would be 8th print, 1st edition, Shadowless and Unlimited. I think a lot of people would say, no, it's the 1st edition, 8th print, Shadowless and Unlimited. I don't think it's really any debate that Shadowless and Unlimited are going to be last in that rarity, just because there was just so many of them, right? There was, there's going to be a lot of Shadowless cards, there's going to be a lot of Unlimited cards, but the 8th print run, we know just from pop count, with graded cards there is not that there isn't a lot of eighth 
eight print cards around that have been graded and same with the first edition so I, I think given that it was the shortest print run most likely that means there's not as many of them available and that means that it's rare to me but like i said if you if you were born in america you couldn't get the i mean most likely you probably couldn't get the eighth print you know especially unless you lived in a smaller city um, and if you're european you couldn't get the first edition card so again it's just a bit of a again you you know wh whatever your opinion is it doesn't really matter when it comes to that it's just a bit of a you know i kind of see the eighth print as a bit rarer so instead of me continuing to ramble on and explain these differences let me actually show you the differences i have a lot of the cards in person so i'll move over to the next room and i'll just show you all the little differences between the four different variants we have here so here I have several different varieties of the base set. I chose Growlithe just because I have the first edition version. So let's start with looking at the difference between the first edition and the Shadowless. On my left is the first edition and on my right is the just regular Shadowless. And as you can see here, just sort of off the rip, there isn't really anything separating them but this first edition stamp. That is the only difference. Otherwise, they are pretty much the exact same template. They both have the 99 on the bottom they both don't have a shadow behind the right hand side of the border here it's just a shadowless variant so there really isn't too much separating them apart i think it's just sort of a bit of a camera trick there as to why the left kind of looks a bit darker than the right but otherwise they are the exact same print the only difference is that first edition stamp so let's now move on to the shadowless versus the unlimited so now on my left, I have the Shadowless Growlithe and on the right, I have the Unlimited version. So let me first show you the biggest difference I use when determining if the card is Shadowless or not, and it's the copyright. So as you can see on the right here for the Unlimited, it does not have the extra 99. So on the bottom here in the copyright date, there's an extra 99 after 98. And on the Unlimited, it does not exist. Now, another big difference is, of course, just the color itself, right? You can see that the Shadowless is a much lighter color variant than on the Unlimited, where the red is much darker and much more noticeable. You've also got then the HP as well. That would be the next one. You can tell it's much more thinner on the Shadowless versus on the Unlimited. The print itself is much bolder. And see here, obviously, much thinner. So that's a pretty major difference. And then the reason why Shadowless gets the name Shadowless is because there is no shadow. There's no drop shadow on this right-hand side. So you can see here, I'll do a little comparison. There's an obvious shadow on the Unlimited card versus the Shadowless card does not have that. Now, a more unobvious and one that you can't really tell too hard you have to look quite closely here i would look on the bottom of the actual artwork itself you can kind of see that the unlimited growlithe is a little more zoomed out because you can tell by the feet it's a little more higher so it's a little more zoomed out than on the shadowless that's the not so more obvious difference but otherwise those are all the major differences between a shadowless card and an unlimited card so let's move on now to the fourth print or the eighth print cards we're going to use an RK9. We'll keep it in the family here. I think I recently sold my Growlithe fourth print, so unfortunately I can't show with that, but this will do just as well. So of course we have Unlimited on the left-hand side here, just based on copyright. That's the way I like to do it. And then on the right, we'll have the eighth print. So let's start with the copyright. Obviously, that's the major difference. On the right here, you have the 1999 to 2000. And of course, that's what separates it apart from the Unlimited version. That is what made it the fourth print. That's the most noticeable difference. There's really only one of the difference, and you can kind of tell just the color, right? The Unlimited is much more red. It's definitely a darker color, where on the eighth print or the fourth print, it is much more lighter. So those are pretty much the only two differences between the two. However, there were two more notable changes in this print run, the first being the change in Vulpix. So let me go ahead and show you that I actually have the Vulpix cards so I can show you the actual difference so just for fun here i'm going to go ahead and do a freeze frame on the cards themselves and i'll give you a couple seconds to try and figure out what the difference is we'll do a little spot the difference game here So apart from the differences I mentioned earlier with the Shadowless cards versus the other printings like the copyright, of course, right? The 1999 to 2000 versus just the regular 99. Vulpix in particular has the same error in all first edition Shadowless and Unlimited prints. 
This is, of course, the HP on the top right corner. So as you can see in the Shadowless card, the HP reads HP 50 instead of 50 HP. And as you can see on the bottom here, the error was corrected in the 8th print, showing 50 HP like it should. The last noticeable difference in the 8th print run is with Charizard. Now, if you managed to catch my video from a couple months back, I showed what all I got while I was visiting England this summer. One of the cards I got was a 1999-2000 to 2000 Charizard card. I'll play back the footage now so you can see the difference between the 8th print and the Unlimited version. The big difference here is the background stripes are slightly different. In the Unlimited version, the black stripes are more defined, whereas in the 8th print, they are faded and almost non-existent so as far as i know these were the only four major differences in the last print of base set compared to the rest Due to production changes in the very first print run of the Japanese set, 96 of the cards were printed without their rarity symbols. In the print runs to follow, the rarity symbols were added back on to every card except for the Fighting Energy, Fire Energy, Grass Energy, Lightning Energy, Psychic Energy, and Water Energy. The cards with no rarity symbols are often referred to as no rarity within the community, and due to only being from the first print run, they are very rare and very highly sought after cards. An example of this being a recent sale in auction for a no rarity symbol Blastoise Hollow PSA 10, it ended up selling for $114,000. As you can see here, the only difference between this print and the others is in the bottom right corner of the card, where you can see no symbol representing the card's rarity. Which, if you don't know, pretty much every card that's ever been printed in the Pokemon TCG has a symbol on the bottom right or bottom left corner of the card, and that symbol just shows the rarity of the card. A circle means the card is a common, a diamond means the card is uncommon, a star means the card is a rare, and lastly, a star with the text promo written over it means it's a promo card. Starting in March 1999, Trinidad cards were created to help teach people and tournament organizers how to play the card game itself. Trainer Deck cards come in two different versions, Trainer Deck A and Trainer Deck B. Trainer Deck A cards would be sent to league leaders at Pokemon Leagues. At the time, Pokemon Leagues were often held at local card shops and Toys R Us stores. Initially, the cards were never intended to be released for sale to the public. However, when they were no longer needed, many league organizers would sell or give away the cards. The distribution of these decks was very limited at the time. Stores would only receive Trainer Deck A, where Trainer Deck B was actually never officially distributed by Wizards of the Coast. Instead, Trainer Deck Bs were found in warehouses, and actually a massive lot of Trainer Deck Bs were found in an auction from Lost Goods at an airport. The person who bought that lot ended up selling them all, so the majority of the boxes that are available to the general public came from that auction. This is why many copies of Trainer Deck B are still sealed, while in comparison it's much harder to find sealed copies of Trainer Deck A. Each deck was themed after one of the two gym leaders in the first generation of games, Game Boy games, these of course being Brock and Misty. Interestingly enough, the deck boxes were actually much smaller than they initially appeared. They actually look closer to a standard sized deck of playing cards. Now, when comparing the trainer deck cards to the unlimited print, there were really no major differences from the two from the front, except for the Trainer Deck A Machamp and Trainer Deck B Blastoise. Both the Machamp and Blastoise were printed without a holographic foil. In addition to this, the Machamp was not printed with a first edition stamp, something we'll talk about later in the video. Trainer Deck cards are easier to spot when looking at the back of the card. Normally, a Pokemon card has a blue border surrounding the back of the card. However, with the Trainer Deck cards, the back is surrounded by a red border. In addition, they also either have the text Trainer Deck A or Trainer Deck B printed in red on the bottom half of the Pokemon ball on the back of the card. Lastly, these trainer cards did not have all 102 cards from the base set. Instead, they had a limited number of cards that you can see on screen now. 
In conclusion, these trainer deck cards worked very well proving that the new Pokemon League organized play could work and be largely successful. This is evident given the next Pokemon World Championship is being held in Honolulu from August 16th to 18th and has a prize pool of over $2 million. I think it's the highest prize pool in the Champion Series circuit to date. So as you can tell, the card game has come a long way since 1999. Now, generally when talking about errors or misprint cards, this concept applies to pretty much all of the vintage cards that have ever been printed. Errors and misprints can be split up into two different categories. The first being the error is printed on every card from that print run and isn't corrected. This is also known as a uncorrected error. The second category is only that a select few cards contain the error or misprint within that print run and are later corrected. This is also known as a corrected error. Naturally, the second category is much rarer and generally more sought after by card collectors. You know, this is because these cards were printed with... Uh, only a handful of these cards were printed with very certain errors. And there are a lot of errors, actually, in this base set. I may miss a few here and there, but for the most part, there are a few famous ones worth mentioning. Probably one of the more famous errors and one of my personal favourites is the No Stage Blastoise error. Now in the unlimited print variant, Blastoise's card had an error where the word stage was completely removed from the text. As you can see on the top right of the card it's supposed to read put Blastoise on the stage 1 card. In the error the word stage is not found making it read put Blastoise on the 1 card. There are two other notable Blastoise errors that are much rarer than this one, the first being the Illustrator Error Blastoise and then the second one being the Red Dot Blastoise. The Illustrator Error Blastoise is missing the abbreviated word for Illustrator on the bottom left corner of Unlimited Prints, and the Red Dot Blastoise has a small red ink dot above Hydro Pump Attack's Water Energy symbol also found with Unlimited Prints. I'd say the second most famous error in the base set is the No Damage Ninetales error. Now, in the Shadowless version of this card found from Brushfire theme decks, the damage number for Fire Blast is missing entirely. This Pikachu error shows a yellow cheek Shadowless design Pikachu with an incomplete first edition stamp, reading only the outline of edition missing both the 1 and the D. This Pikachu error has been found inside the Shadowless Zap theme decks and is often referred to as Ghost Stamp Pikachu. Unlimited versions of War Turtle had an error where the Evolution box had War Turtle instead of Squirtle. These are quite hard to find given there was only a small print run for this error before it ended up being corrected. Now it's important to note that all Portuguese first edition and Unlimited prints have this error as well, meaning they were probably printed from the same facility. Another notable error is the rotated energy symbol Diglett error. This error shows the fighting energy symbol for the dig attack rotated at 90 degrees counterclockwise. This error was found to be from a print run of unlimited two player starter set boxes. The last notable error I will mention is the water energy misalignment error. Now this was an error with the unlimited water energy prints where the top of the card was accidentally misaligned higher than intended. This basically made the energy symbol and the title of the energy card too high so it almost appears like it's cut off and misaligned. Those were in my opinion the most notable corrected errors from the base set. There are many more. I think in total there's about 40 something errors from this set. If you want to find out more I'd suggest you go to Bulbapedia and type in error cards. They have a full list of the confirmed notable error cards that are prevalent in every Pokemon set to date. I use that information for my fossil and jungle collections so that I can ensure I get all the error cards for my sets. Before we move on, while we're on the topic of errors, let's go ahead and go over some of the more notable uncorrected errors and some of the cards that are considered errors but really in actuality are not errors. So let's start with some of the uncorrected errors. I actually own quite a lot of them. We're just going to do three for the sake of time though. So I'm going to show you the three I think most notable errors that are, have been uncorrected basically were never fixed. Let's start with the spacing error Gyarados. So to my right I have my childhood Gyarados from the base set and then my Alakazam as well. So just on the bottom here where the actual set number is, the set the, the 6 out of 102 and the 1 out of 102, you can just tell that the Gyarados 
it's just slightly a bit to the left. I'm, I'll grab a sleeve here and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Align your eyes with the box of the bio on the bottom there, the Pokedex entry, and you can pretty obviously tell that the 6 out of 102 is just a bit further to the left compared to the Alakazam. So all Basic Gyarados had this printing error. They, were, they never fixed it, surprisingly, in any of the new print runs that they did. So this is something that has been kept, and you'll it's really hard to tell, to be honest, but every Gyarados has that. Moving on now to the Japanese Evolution Box Holographic Foil error. So all of the Japanese holo cards that have evolving Pokemon have the holo foil overlapping the bottom of the Evolution Box. So as you can kind of see here, I'll keep my English... Alakazam out and then this is my Japanese Alakazam. You can tell that in the English they, the hollow bleed actually goes around the underneath of the stage 2 evolution box but in the Japanese they just go straight over it and you can it's obvious because the actual hollow on the left hand side is a completely different colour it doesn't have the purple. Last but not least let's go over the Monster Ball Voltorb error. So the first edition and Shadowless versions of this card all have the same error and it's in the Pokedex entry on the bottom here so I have the Shadowless here and it says usually found in power plants easily mistaken for a monster ball it has zapped many people so obviously that is the japanese way of saying pokeball and on the unlimited version they fix that so you can see that it says easily mistaken for a pokeball there are many more uncorrected errors that I just won't go into too much detail about. They're mainly spelling errors. So some have incorrect bios, basically the Pokemon's length and weight are wrong. Some have the HP switched around, like the Vulpix I showed earlier. And some are missing words or outright have words misspelled. But the three I just talked about are what I would consider to be the most notable. Moving on now to three cards that are sometimes regarded as error cards, but in actuality are not. The error Black Flame Ninetales is considered a rarer variant and is only found on unlimited prints. This Ninetales shows the flames in the artwork are black, like the Shadowless artwork, instead of blue, like most of the unlimited prints. Wizards of the Coast changed the design at some point during the unlimited print, making the Black Flame's Ninetales less common, but not necessarily an error. The Red Cheeks Pikachu is a variant found on 1st edition, Shadowless, and the E3 promo prints that can be often seen as an error. The story goes that the famous illustrator Mitsuhiro Arita originally submitted the artwork of the base set Pikachu with yellow cheeks. Wizards of the Coast employees thought the cheeks were supposed to be red. So actually when printing the card, they changed the colour to red without permission. Now, later on, it was switched back to having yellow cheeks, just as originally intended, because obviously Pikachu's cheeks turn yellow during an attack. This explains why Arita wanted them to be yellow in the first place. Because this was an intentional design change, it should not be considered as an error. While we're here and on the topic of Pikachu within the base set, let's talk about the several different printings that Pikachu had. As I just mentioned, there was a Pikachu known as Red Cheeks Shadowless E3. This is considered a promotional card given away at the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles during May 13th to 15th in 1999. The notable points on the card are obviously the cheeks are coloured red and there is an E3 stamp where the set symbol would normally be. Next, we have the Unlimited Yellow Cheeks E3 Pikachu. This version was available in the magazine Nintendo Power and was in the September 1999 issue. This version of E3 Pikachu had all the characteristics of an unlimited base set card, including the corrected yellow cheeks. The only difference is that it had an E3 stamp on it. Now, next we have the Poketor Pikachu. Poketor Pikachu is considered another promo card. Now, this card was included in tour packs. They were also referred to as show bags that were distributed at locations visited by the Poketor in Australia in 1999. These cards were advertised to be limited to, I think, 3,000 in total at each venue. The Poketor compromised of two separate tours, Red, which ran on the weekends from September 18th to October 9th in 1999, and Blue, which ran at separate venues on the weekends from September 18th to October 7th. Now, the main reason that this Poketor existed in the first place was for fans of the games to be able to obtain Mew on their game cartridges. Secondarily, of course, it was used to promote the Pokemon trading card game, but mainly people, that was the only time they could get Mew, so that was the main purpose why I imagine a lot of people went. And as to why this card is quite rare, because I'm sure not a lot of people cared about it at the time. 
The only difference between this card compared to the unlimited Pikachu is that the Tour 1999 logo is in the top right corner of the artwork. Now moving on to the CD promo Shadowless Pikachu, this card was produced by Media Factory in Japan and was included in the Pokemon Song Best Collection CD. The difference between this card and its Shadowless counterpart is the card stock used. If you're familiar with old school Yu-Gi-Oh cards then you're probably familiar with different card stocks. Just like in Yu-Gi-Oh when cards were either glossy or wavy, in this case with the Pikachu CD promo the Japanese stock is much more smoother and less grey in comparison to its English counterpart. Lastly, let's talk about the Cosmos Hollow Machamp. Now, these are my two childhood Machamps, so as you can see, they're pretty beat up, but regardless, they will work for this example. Base set and many other vintage hollows were printed using a starlight hollow foil pattern, which is the card on the left here. However, some of the Machamps were printed with a Cosmos hollow pattern instead, that you can see there on the right. These Machamp cards were found inside the two player CD ROM starter set deck. This deck contained base set 2 cards and a reprint of the unlimited Machamp with base set 2's Cosmos hollow pattern. Now, while we're here, let's also talk about the fact that the only exception to the rule of unlimited printings lacking a first edition symbol was the base set Machamp. Now, in the two-player starter set and the two-player CD-ROM starter set deck boxes, all Machamps had first edition stamps printed on them. This is why when you, you know, if you were to come across a Machamp in your old Pokemon collection, it will have a first edition stamp on it. The last two major topics I want to discuss about the base set is the thick versus thin first edition stamps and of course some of the sealed products that came from the base set. If you've been collecting for a while now, the thick versus thin first edition stamps are probably something you're very familiar with, or at the very least you've heard of it. The biggest misconception that many new collectors get wrong with thick versus thin is the name comes from the one on the inside of the circle, not the ink's thickness. I made this mistake when I first started collecting. I always thought it was based on the ink, so the thin stamps, like the ink itself, significantly looks much thicker, so it's kind of easy to confuse the two. The cause for the difference between the thick and thin has to do with the pressure of the stamping machine. The more pressure caused thin stamps to basically have more ink applied to them, uh, and it sort of created the difference in the look between the two. In terms of rarity, finding a thick stamp hollow foil is rarer than normal, and finding a thin stamped non hollow card is rarer than normal. While we're on the talk of all these different stamps, Base Set also introduced the first edition grey stamp. Now, this stamp was caused by the printed card sheets stacked on top of one another, and they weren't given enough time for the ink to actually settle. This sort of meant that some of the ink would bleed into the sheet itself above it, and then when separated, part of the ink was removed, leaving a grey looking stamp. Obviously, this didn't happen often, so grey stamps are pretty fairly rare to find. The last major point I want to make in this deep dive is going over some of the vintage sealed products that came out with the base set. Given vintage Pokemon cards in general, a lot of the sealed stuff has just blown up since 2020, and, you know, with that has come a lot of controversies, right? You've got a lot of fake, fraudulent, tampered with vintage sealed boxes, you've even got CT scanning nowadays, so just to be on the safe side, I think it's important to go ahead and go into detail of some of the vintage sealed boxes, as well as show pictures, and like I say, just kind of show you what you would be wanting to look for if you were trying to get into that market of buying sealed products. Starting with with a big piece of history, let's go over the Demo Booster Packs, known to many as Demo Packs. These packs predate the release of first edition cards and were America's first look into the Pokemon trading card game. Demo Packs were generally seen at Magic events and sent out to card shops to introduce players to the new cards and game mechanics. You generally find these on display shelves to promote the game, they weren't really intended to be sold. Very few of these packs survived, most of course were open to try out the new cards, right? They were definitely used as promotional and not necessarily uh, as a collector's item to actually keep uh, sealed. So the demo packs contained 24 shadowless cards and the deck list is as follows. 
Since the cards themselves are no different from any other Shadowless card, the sealed pack itself is the appeal for vintage collectors. In terms of current value, I've seen the demo packs recently sell for around $500 on eBay, which to be honest, I know is a lot of money, but for something that predates first edition Shadowless, to me that seems quite cheap. I've obviously seen some go for more than $500, but still, that's really not that bad compared to some of the other sealed base set stuff that we're gonna come up to here next. Moving on now to base set booster packs, there are actually 30 different pack variants. These consist of 10 different types of packs with 3 unique artworks. Packs have 11 cards in total, 1 rare, 3 uncommon, 5 commons and 2 energy cards. Also it's worth mentioning there is a 1 in 3 chance of the rare being a holographic. There are 6 distinct characteristics of a booster pack. First you have the artwork, the first edition stamp, the trading card game logo placement, the copyright dates, the country where the pack was manufactured, and the seal type. Starting with the artworks, you have the three most iconic Pokemon in history, Blastoise, Charizard, and Venusaur. I personally only ever managed to get my hands on the Blastoise and Venusaur pack artworks, plus they're in French, but either way I still think they're very cool. Next we have the first edition booster pack. This type of pack is defined by having a first edition stamp on the bottom right corner of the pack itself. There is actually an error pack we'll talk about here in a minute that shows a first edition stamp on the pack but actually has non first edition cards inside. We then have the TCG logo placement. It can either be found on the bottom or the top of the pack. The bottom logo placement will show just above the text 11 tradable game cards and the top logo placement will be just underneath the trademark Pokemon logo. In the bottom logo placement there is always the back of three small cards on the right corner above the logo. Packs with the logo on the bottom are generally considered shadowless packs and packs with the logo on the top are considered to be unlimited packs. It's important to note that the cards inside of base set packs are actually never guaranteed to have what we think should be inside of them. I'll kind of explain what I mean by that later on. Next up we have the copyright dates distinction. In order to find the copyright date of a booster pack you must lift the flap on the back of the pack. As you can see on the left side here it shows the country of where it was manufactured and on the bottom right shows the full copyright date. The copyright dates can either be the common 1999 or the 1999 to 2000, which if you remember are the 8th print variants we talked about earlier. So if you're looking to pull an 8th print holo with the copyright date 1999 to 2000, the best chance you have would be to find a pack that has both the correct copyright date 1999 to 2000 and the country of origin as the UK. Personally though, I'd recommend you just finding it as a single and buying it that way. It just isn't really worth the risk of you trying to pack it. Lastly, we have the seal type, which is surprisingly one of the more important characteristics of a base set booster pack. There are three different types of seals. You have a long seal, a short seal, and a hanger seal. Hanger seals are generally the hardest to find given they couldn't be inside of a booster box, right? They had to be an individual pack on a hanger. Even rarer is something I think I saw Gary, the King Pokemon guy who's famous for having all the Shadowless Charizards, I have probably the world's number one Pokemon collection inside this case. Little figures? Cards, and they're all Charizards. He had a graded hanger pack that still had the Chad intact. Now, the Chad is that little piece of plastic that is punctured when the pack would be put on the hanger. So this pack in particular was meant to be put on a hanger and for whatever reason, never was. And someone managed to buy it for $2.97 it shows there, which to be honest, the fact it was graded with the sticker makes it just that much cooler to me. I also wanted to mention some of the error packs that came with the base set. You you may have seen these, I know big influencers usually freak out about them, but it's basically these packs that have this uh, black triangle in the bottom right of the pack. These are known as triangle stamp packs. The story goes that many booster packs were accidentally printed with a first edition logo on the bottom right. So to prevent people from thinking they were buying a first edition pack, Wizards of the Coast attempted to block the stamp by putting a big old black triangle over it. I will say they are definitely cool and if I were focused on having a sealed collection, this error pack would definitely be a must-have. Wizards of the Coast did a pretty good job though with covering up the first edition stamp, so actually what's rarer to find is the other error pack being the misprinted first edition stamp pack. Basically first edition packs that didn't get the triangle. 
These packs generally came from staff members and employees of Wizards of the Coast, so I don't know if they were actually released to the general public. The only way you'd be able to tell if you had one of those packs is of course by the TCG logo placement. Keep in mind, this is only true for the English versions of base set packs. I mentioned earlier about packs not having guarantees of which variant could be inside of them. Yet again, Colors has provided a fantastic chart going over all of the different variants that can be inside base set packs, based on the characteristics I just named off. When it comes to the current values of booster packs, I've seen unlimited packs go for around $400 to $900. It just sort of depends on if the pack is weighed or not. I know a Venusaur artwork first edition Shadowless pack recently sold for $2,800, and then a light first edition Charizard artwork pack recently went for $3,250. Unlimited hanger packs range from around $250 to $430, and the only $1999 to $2,000 U. UK pack I found was a heavy pack that recently sold for around $440. Lastly, I've seen those triangle error packs that are pretty cool looking, right? I saw them sell for around $400 to $500. Moving on now to blister packs, there's honestly not too much to say about blister packs. Apart from the visual appeal, they were just designed to make it easier to hang packs for shop displays. There was a cool unique blister pack that featured both a base set pack and a jungle booster pack, so that's kind of worth mentioning, and one recently sold on eBay for about $860. Blisters are also much harder to weigh than a standard pack. If you don't know what weighing means, I've kind of talked about it previously, I talked about it with the booster packs. Weighing basically means the hollow in the pack weighs a tiny bit more than the non-hollow. So by weighing the packs in, let's say, like a full booster box, you could quite easily keep all the heavy packs and sell all the light packs, leaving you with all the hits. It's pretty scummy, to be honest, but with the expense of the cards nowadays, it makes sense to me why there's always going to be some bad actors in this hobby, and there's always going to be bad actors in general in any field that you choose. Um, so if you've ever heard people say it's a heavy pack or today we're opening up a heavy pack, it basically means they've weighed the pack in advance and they know that they're guaranteed going to get a hollow hit. They don't know what hollow they're going to hit unless they CT scan it, but they, they guarantee they're going to get themselves a hollow. Um, I personally prefer the surprise. You know, I prefer figuring out, you know, uh, you know, not knowing in advance if it's going to be a hit or not. But I get why people do it, at least with vintage packs, just because of how expensive they are. But if you do it for like a $4 pack, then... I mean, come on, grow up. A blister pack of the Blastoise artwork recently sold on eBay for $750 plus shipping. Let's move on now to base set booster boxes. In today's current market, sealed booster boxes are well over the $10,000 range, going upwards to $200,000 for first edition boxes. Given the last first edition Charizard in PSA 10 went for around $180,000 in April of this year, the price of 200000 for a box seems about right. Keep note that back in 2022, that same card sold for 420000 so just a bit like Boeing, it's just not been Charizard's year. Booster boxes contain 36 packs, which only 12 of those packs have holofoils. There are many distinguishable features of a booster box in order to tell what types of prints you'd expect to see inside. There are first edition indicators, Wizards of the Coast logos, a Charizard artwork change, and like the booster packs, an indication of the country which manufactured the box. The first edition marker is an easy spot. The indication of it being a first edition box or not is shown by the text on the bottom right of the box facing upwards. The text reads, first edition limited printing, and has the first edition stamp right above it. Next, we have the Wizards of the Coast logo. There are two different ways the logo is shown. A booster box can just also have no logo altogether. If there is a logo, it is either curved or square. We then have the two different Charizard artworks that are on the side of the base set booster box. These boxes are commonly referred to as either a green wing or a blue wing Charizard. The artworks are obviously distinctly different, meaning if someone wanted to collect these expensive boxes, they would want both a green wing and a blue wing box. The Green Wing artwork was produced by the famous Mitsuhiro Arita, who we've talked about previously, and the Blue Wing by Ken Sugimori, which is also, well, I'd say arguably they're the two most well-known illustrators of the Pokemon TCG of all time. Arita is famous for doing the artwork for the base set Charizard, and Sugimori is famous for doing the base set Blastoise, which is arguably one of my favourite artworks of all time. 
Moving on now to the three different indications on the bottom of every booster box that show the country the box was manufactured by. As previously mentioned with the 8th print variants, the three countries these boxes will reside from are the USA, Australia or the UK. The final difference in base set booster boxes is the contact information found on the bottom of every box. This is often referred to as a country code. Now there's three different ways that you'll see this displayed. You either have single contact information, no contact information at all, or there'll be multiple forms of contact information on the bottom of the box. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you a graph that sort of explains the different combinations of what we just mentioned and how you can use that to figure out what you can expect to find inside each booster box. Base set has five theme decks in total, the first being one that we mentioned earlier in the video, the two player starter set. This is the theme deck that has the exclusive first edition Machamp card, and in terms of current value, a sealed two player starter deck recently sold for $175 on eBay. The second theme deck in base set is known as Blackout, which features the holographic Hitmonchan inside. There is also a rule book, damage counters, a chancy coin, and a card checklist inside. This sealed theme deck is valued anywhere from $190 up to $235 I've seen it sell for. The third theme deck is Brushfire. This features a Charmeleon and Nidoran on the front of the box. The hollow inside of this theme deck is a Ninetales, and Light Blackout also has the damage counters, a Chansey Coin, rule book, and checklist. I'm just going to go ahead and say because I'm going to repeat myself five different times here. Every single one of these theme decks has a damage counter, a chancy coin, a rule book, and a checklist, okay? A sealed brush fire deck ranges from $150 to $250. The next theme deck is known as Overgrowth, and that sports a Gyarados and Ivysaur on the front cover. The hollow inside this deck was a Gyarados. And I think I've seen this theme deck go for, I think it's the most expensive one actually. It costs you around $250 to $325 sealed. Last but not least, the fifth theme deck of base set is known as Zap. This theme deck has a hollow Mewtwo inside of it and the cover actually shows a Mewtwo and Pikachu together. This runs for about the same price as Overgrowth. It's anywhere from $240 to $275. In all of these theme decks, you can either find Shadowless, Unlimited, or 8th Print cards. We talked about some of the big error cards earlier in the video, like the No Damage Nine Tails that can be found in Brushfire, the Sideways Fighting Symbol Diglett, that's in the two-player starter set, and of course the Ghost Pikachu we talked about is in the Zap theme deck. In addition to these error cards, there's actually quite a lot of different variations with the theme decks themselves. These can provide hints as to what type of cards you'd find, you'd expect to find inside of the theme decks themselves. Uh, these factors, of course, can change, can change pricing. It can definitely affect pricing if you know what you're looking for. Beginning with the two player starter set, these decks can be opened from either the top of the box or from the side of the box. And on the front of the box, there is sometimes an asterisk next to the trademark of the Pokemon logo. One of the bigger differences that can be found is on the back of the box, where you can either find cards featuring different artworks or just energy cards. Also on the back, the Pokemon logo itself can either be left aligned or centered. The pull strip used to break the seal of the actual theme deck itself can either be gold or clear. And lastly, each two player starter set can have a different copyright date as well, the three we've come to know throughout this video. Of course, the copyright date with the additional 99 will be considered shadowless. The one lacking the 99 is the unlimited copy. And then of course, the 99 to 2000 copyright is the eighth print. Now I'll show a chart with all the different combinations of variants to sort of reveal what you can expect to find inside of these two player starter set decks. The other four theme decks have differences with their pull strips, the artworks on the back of the box, and yet again, their copyright dates. The pull strips can be three different types, either a gold horizontal pull strip, a vertical pull strip, or a horizontal pull strip. Next, the card artworks on the back of the boxes can have three different layouts. The first layout is that the middle card will be in the front of the two energies, revealing the full face of the middle card, and they will also have damage counters above. The second layout is that the middle card will be behind the two energies and, the, and will still have damage counters showing. And then lastly, the third layout is that the middle card will be in front of the two energies, but there will be no damage counters. Lastly, the copyright dates will either be ending in 1999 or 1999 to 2000. 
And now I'll show another chart that explains the different variants or the characteristics I just mentioned and using all that to show what different types of cards you may come to find inside of these four other theme decks. Last but not least, we have the gift boxes that were sent out in order to help promote the Pokemon TCG early on. The first gift box was the starter gift set box. If you want to see an opening of this box, I'm pretty sure I saw a Chattatronic re-upload of him opening one back in 2015. So go check that out if you want to see what all is inside. The gift box itself has two theme decks, a jungle set booster pack, a huge play mat with tips and tricks on the back, and a cool looking Eevee coin. One of the two theme decks will be a two player starter set, and the second is a jungle set theme deck, which will either be Power Reserve or Water Blast. I think the video I'm talking about, he got a Power Reserve theme deck. Another gift box that circulated around this time pretty early on was the 1999 UK promotional gift box. This last sold in auction for around $2,700 back in May 2023. There's honestly not too much information about this box other than the main fact that it was used to promote the TCG in the European market. Each promo box contained three base set booster packs, a two player starter set, one promotional window poster and one promotional booklet. Instead of instructions about the game like a manual, this booklet actually had a sales pitch for the Pokemon TCG. It included the brand's goals for Europe, it had proof of Pokemon's success in other markets, and even had data supporting the game's popularity among its target audience. Because these promotional gifts were distributed to game shops to sort of help children play the actual game itself, sealed boxes are incredibly scarce and rarely surface online for sale. The last gift box I'll mention is the Japanese 1996 Gold Gift Box. This box, like the UK promotional gift box, was sold in May 2023 for a whopping $26,400. This gift box is to date the rarest Pokemon Seal product from Japan. The box released on December 12th, 1996, and because they hit the shelves really early on before Pokemon became even popular in Japan, many went unsold. Each gold gift box contains two 60 card starter decks, an instruction manual, a game map, 30 damage counters, two custom coins, and four poison markers. The box also includes the first printing of a Sobikata magazine, sorry if I mispronounced that, and that basically in English means easily understand how to play Pokemon cards magazine. This contained two highly coveted promo cards, a no rarity Pikachu featuring Keiji Kinabuchi's famed Ivy Pikachu artwork, and a no rarity Jigglypuff featuring Kinabuchi's singing Jigglypuff illustration. These two promo cards are technically the very first two Pokemon cards ever made. Lastly, I wanted to go over some other noteworthy details and some fun facts that relate to the base set. Starting with, of course, Pokemon's 20th anniversary back in 2016, the set named Evolutions released. This set is the reprint of the base set with the addition of, at the time, newly introduced Mega Pokemon. This is the set that actually got me back into collecting Pokemon cards myself. It was very fun. It was a very fun set to open, but unfortunately now is extremely overpriced due to the set's hype around that COVID time. You also had the 25th anniversary set, Celebrations, that featured reprints of the three base set starter Pokemon. Lastly, when it came to different language releases, the Spanish printing in particular had four different variants. It had the first edition 1999 copyright, first edition 1999 to 2000 copyright, an unlimited 1999 copyright, and an unlimited 1999 to 2000 copyright. This means the Spanish version is the only language to have a first edition unlimited print card. Of course, apart from Machamp, right? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is everything that the base set has to offer. I'm sure I missed a couple things here and there, but for the most part, from a collector's perspective, that should be everything you need to know, especially if you wanted to start collecting the base set yourself. I know we didn't really go into too much detail about some of the Japanese sealed products that came out with the base set, and I probably missed another couple things here and there. But like I say, for the most part, that should be pretty much everything. This is my first time doing a deep dive on any subject really, especially like the base set, one of the most iconic sets in the Pokemon in Pokemon history. So if you enjoyed this, please, like I say, let me know down below in the comments. Any feedback will be positive to me just because I want to see if this is something that you want me to continue to make. I enjoyed making this video. It was a lot of work and a lot of research and a lot of, you know, 
camera work that I'm not used to, but I'll gladly, like I say, continue if, if people like it. So um, I think the next thing I would do would maybe be the jungle or the fossil set. Those are the sets that I collect personally, and I do collect base set, but I more religiously collect those two sets. So maybe if I do a deep dive on those, and go into every single detail about the sets. Maybe I'll learn something new about those as well. I definitely know I did that with this this video with base set. I thought I pretty much knew everything about base set going into this video, but even I learned a couple new things. There was a lot of, especially with the sealed products, there was a lot of stuff I didn't really know about some of the gift boxes and things like that that came out with the base set. So hopefully it was the same for you as well. And if you are still watching up to this point, thank you very much. I know it's been a solid hour here. So thank you for watching up to this point. And like I say, just comment and let me know what you think down below. Like I say, any feedback will be uh, will be useful for me. So I'm not going to ramble any longer. I've been talking for quite some time now. So let me go. Just go ahead and say thank you again for watching, and uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe, do all that good stuff. And I will catch you in the next video.